Last week, I put out my Dragon Ball Z video. And while you'd think 33 minutes of a grown man having an emotional breakdown over a children's cartoon would mean that I'd be done talking about the series, the structure and focus of that video meant that I wasn't left with much room to talk about one of my favorite aspects of Z, the manga. Not only is the Dragon Ball Z manga a far punchier, tightly paced story than either anime, but it also has the distinct advantage of being illustrated by Akira Toriyama, who, as we discussed in our Genius of Dragon Ball video, is very, very good at drawing manga. And in this regard, I'd consider Dragon Ball Z his strongest work. Z is a very different kind of story from Dragon Ball. With Dragon Ball, Toriyama was still trying to write a comedy adventure manga for an audience that was increasingly demanding action and combat. And you can see this in a lot of the designs. Many of the characters from Dragon Ball don't feel designed to fight, with short, stumpy limbs and oddly proportioned bodies. And while this juxtaposition of cute character designs and combat is a large part of the appeal of Dragon Ball, it did cause Toriyama some problems, in particular in Goku's design. As Toriyama would often have to stretch and elongate Goku's short, stumpy limbs just so he could make contact with his opponents. And so, much to the ire of the Shonen Jump editorial staff, Toriyama made the decision to age Goku's design into a fully proportioned adult, repurposing the character for the new, more combat-centric direction of the story. And you can see this same change in philosophy in every design in Dragon Ball Z, with the softer line work of Dragon Ball giving way to the cleaner, more angled, harder look of Z, with a much stronger focus on depicting the musculature of its characters, as well as power through through its illustrations. And while I do find Toriyama's softer artwork more charming, I don't think it can be argued that the latter is more effective at conveying the weight, momentum, and impact that are so important to the many fights of Dragon Ball Z. The fight scenes in Z are always ferocious, desperate affairs. While many of the fights in Dragon Ball were contests of skill, these are now vicious life or death battles, and Toriyama's artwork has evolved to reflect that. There's an expressiveness to the artwork of Z that was not present in Dragon Ball, bringing to life all the pride, rage, and pain of these characters with an unflinching clarity. And it really helps tell the story of these battles, making them feel less like standard throwaway encounters and more like violent emotional affairs between two characters who both really desperately wanted to win. And the increased focus and scale of these encounters means that Toriyama is able to fully showcase his exceptional ability to convey action through manga. The way I see it, there are two types of manga artists, and what separates them is how they utilize the medium of manga. Of the first group, I'd count artists behind series like Fairy Tale, Fire Force, and Death Note. I'm not criticizing the artwork or story of these series, Rather, just the fact that they don't use manga to do or say anything that couldn't be done and possibly done better by a competent anime adaption. Of the three I've mentioned, Death Note is probably the prime example of this. While the drawings are very good, the paneling and layouts are extremely basic. Mostly just simple page designs consisting of five or six panels of characters' heads talking and speech bubbles which, while perfectly readable, doesn't use any of the strengths inherent to manga in a way that isn't directly recreatable in other mediums. Of the second group, I'd count artists like Katsuhiro Etomo of Akira, Hirohiko Araki of Jojo's Bizarre Adventure, and Junji Ito of Uzumaki, and so much more. These are artists who seem inherently focused on leveraging the advantages of manga and using it to deliver an experience that's entirely unique to any other medium. Whether it's the way Junji Ito controls a reader's anticipation through page turns, or Otomo's remarkable ability to control action and flow through nuanced paneling. Even completely divorced from the quality of the artwork or the story, these are my favorite manga to read, purely by virtue that reading them feels so good. And the reason for that is that these are all artists who understand the technique behind page layout, paneling, and composition, and know how to use these techniques to control a reader's attention and guide them through a page. Check out this page from Akira. Even completely out of context, the way the page is laid out combined with the strength of the individual compositions means that even isolated from the actual overarching narrative with all the text removed, the page itself tells a perfectly readable story. 
And this is something Toriyama himself has actually commented on. Speaking in an interview with the Japanese publication Wired, he said, as a rule, you can understand the content to a certain extent with just pictures, and words are nothing more than a supplement to them. To put it a different way, there's an invisible guiding language to manga, in the same way there's editing in filmmaking or gameplay design in video games. And finding artists who can take advantage of this language and leverage it to enhance every aspect of their story this is why I still read manga, despite how much I love animation. And the argument I'd like to make today is that no one has a better grasp of this language than Akira Toriyama. What makes Toriyama so special as a mangaka is his ability to tell these visual stories through his fights, combined with his ability to portray action through comics. He'll often take the time to illustrate very minute moments of a fight and establish a sense of narrative through them. There's one instance of this I really enjoy from the Vegeta vs Imperfect Cell battle, where Cell lands an attack on Vegeta and Toriyama dedicates nearly an entire page to Vegeta turning his head and smiling at Cell. It's such a minor moment, but by letting it breathe like this, it so effectively conveys the story of this fight and each character's place within it in a way that would be impossible through just dialogue. But it's this subtle level of visual storytelling combined with his ability to convey action that makes Toriyama's manga so goddamn special. Generally, comics are not the place people go when they want to experience action. So much of the excitement and energy of an action scene comes from the conveyance of movement and force, something that's quite difficult to capture with still images. But despite this, movement has always been a big part of Toriyama's work. We talked a lot about his ability to create sequential stories from a single image in our previous video, but that technique has been evolved and brought to new heights in Z. One of the biggest differences between the combat in original Dragon Ball and Dragon Ball Z is that now every character has the ability of flight, which opens up a world of possibilities in terms of the specific combat scenario, but also greatly increases the complexity of the movement of its characters, as fighters can now attack each other from 360 degrees, which could be very difficult to convey through manga alone. But Watch how Toriyama has evolved his sequential imaging technique to solve this problem, and in particular in this page from the Frieza saga. The key here is how Toriyama uses Vegeta's energy trail to guide our eye through the events of the page. Our starting position is here, where the path of Vegeta's punch takes us down through the first panel, exploding off the side of Raccoon's skull and guiding our eye down to the starting position on the second panel. And from here, the energy trail shows us Vegeta's first position in front of Raccoon and leads our eye in an arc as he circles directly behind his collapsing opponents, while also bringing us neatly to the starting position on panel 3 and again guiding our eye down the path of action as he dive bombs his unsuspecting foe. If I just let my eye fall on this page, my gaze travels down through the composition without any conscious thought for myself and yet each beat of action registers clearly in my mind, and that focus is never broken by me wondering where my eye should go next. Just look at how less readable this page is if we remove Vegeta's energy trail. If you want to see more about this aspect of the manga, the channel Bryhard has a great video on the subject that I'll link in the description below. It's with this technique that Toriyama is able to communicate a genuine sense of speed and velocity through his work. But I think just as impressive is his ability to bring that action to a crushing halt with his exceptionally done impact panels. What I find so interesting about these panels and what makes them hit so hard is Toriyama's use of anticipation panels before them. Anticipation is a principle more commonly talked about in animation than comics, and is basically conveying to an audience that something is about to happen before either fulfilling or subverting that expectation. And Toriyama uses this principle to imbue his impact panels with a genuine feeling of weight and force. Check out this page from the Namek Saga of Raccoon kicking Gohan. It's a beautifully done page and an exceptional drawing, but watch how dramatically more impactful it feels when we bring in the previous page in the spread, and specifically this panel right here, where Gohan's attack whiffs and Raccoon dodges upwards, drawing his massive leg back in preparation for the oncoming attack. 
At this point, Toriyama's dedicated basically an entire page to a simple attack missing, but in doing so, he's given us all the information we need to understand Rakum's specific position in relation to Gohan, meaning our minds can now fill in the empty space between the two panels, and as a result, we feel the exact path Rakum's kick has travelled, and can understand how he's twisted the full crushing weight of his massive body into Gohan's neck with this attack. So essentially, what Toriyama's done with this spread is use this brief moment of anticipation to create the feeling of real genuine movement and force. And by comparison, the same instance in the anime lacks that same level of impact, as it plays down that moment of anticipation, robbing the attack itself of the show-stopping finality it has in the manga. So what Toriyama is able to do is use manga in a way that is completely unique to the medium to create a genuine sense of velocity and action, and then bring that action to a crushing halt using anticipation panels to foreshadow giant impactful moments. And it's all brought to life with the beautifully distinctive artwork, and it's the combination of these elements that make Toriyama's manga so enjoyable to read. Still to this day, if I pick up any copy of Dragon Ball Z, I can lose minutes or even hours purely by virtue of how good the manga is at drawing me in and controlling my attention. And what I think is interesting is when you compare this aspect of the manga with that of Dragon Ball Super. Dragon Ball Super, or Cho, is the follow-up series to Dragon Ball Z, created 18 years after the conclusion of the original, with the series now being overseen by Toriyama, who would provide the plot outlines and character concepts, but actually illustrated by Toyotaro, a young manga artist who got his start in the industry by writing and illustrating a popular Dragon Ball Z fan comic called Dragon Ball AF. I think for a guy who basically started out drawing DBZ Dojinshi, Toyotaro has done incredibly well for himself. And I don't feel all that good about comparing him to one of the greatest manga authors of all time, but I feel like there's a point to be made here. Without making any comment on the story or artwork, what really stands out to me about Super is the lack of underlying technique in its layout and construction. The same grasp of visual storytelling just isn't there, and neither is that hyper-considered sense of design that makes the original so enjoyable to read. Compare this page to the page we'd previously discussed, and notice the complete absence of any flow or any unified sense of design among the panels, and just ask yourself, which page is your eye drawn to more? Rather, each panel by itself just feels singular, to be consumed and then moved on from, and as a result, it's missing that intangible underlying spark that made the original so special, meaning it just feels like what it is. A Dragon Ball Z fan comic. I only raise this point because I think it's only in reading Super did I realise how important this aspect was in my experience of reading Dragon Ball Z, and how it contributed to the unique and ultimately rewarding experience rereading the manga was. If there's one thing my Twitter feed has taught me since the release of last week's video, it's that people have very strong opinions about what way Dragon Ball Z should be watched. And while the Funimation dub is always going to be my preference, given it's the version I grew up with, I think any fan of Dragon Ball Z owes it to themselves to experience the manga. Not only because this was the spark that would later result in the impacts that Dragon Ball Z had around the world, but because it's one of the greatest mangaka of our lifetime expressing his story in a way that only manga really can. Friends, thank you once again for joining me today, and I really hope you enjoyed today's video. I'd like to give a huge shout out to my glorious patrons who as ever made this and especially the previous video possible. And if you'd like to become one of them, you can do so over at patreon.com slash super eyepatchwolf. This video in particular, I'd like to thank John Case, Sam Wright, Jordan Hoxie, Kamau Obasi Lloyd Walker, Urban the Myth, Sleepy Bear, and the Nope Train Express. As always, find me on the Let's Fight a Boss video game podcast or on Twitter at iPatchWolf. Friends, take care of yourselves, and I'll see you next time.